Let me begin at the beginning of your talk with us, Paul. You talk about uh, the life of the soul and the life of the cinema, uh, two phases, you could say, of your life, and that you saw them meeting in style, not in content. So I was reflecting on that. If you looked at Christian theology, for example, you have the style of active, active style in the storytelling. That's Heilsgeschichte, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. There's a narrative arc, it's going somewhere. And you have, on the other hand, the contemplative style. Um, meditation, centering prayer, where it doesn't go anywhere, it is. It has nothing to do with doing, it has to do with being. So my question, Rich, I'll put you on the spot, and then I'll ask Paul. If we took seriously those two different forms of storytelling as both being important, what would that mean for us as theologians, as seminarians, as church people? Yeah, well, as I've heard, <clears throat> you know, Paul lecturing now and, and in discussions in the last day or so, I was thinking about the fact that the tradition in which the two of us were raised uh, was very much hearing the law and then acting. Uh, that's what happened in church. Uh, you went, you heard things, and then you acted on the basis of what you heard. Uh, a person who did kind of a survey of recent ethical thought uh, put it this way. He said that uh, for much, much of the 20th century, it was an ethics of duty, a hearing and doing. But now we're emphasizing more seeing and being. And it seems to me you're very, you, you've moved to a very seeing and being uh, stage. And uh, I think that's important for the life of the church. Even many of us in the Protestant world, the Reformed, uh, Calvinist world, have learned so much from Henry Nouwen, from uh, Thomas Merton, from uh, the traditional disciplines. And, uh, uh, you know, a couple of people from Fuller have just gone to St. Andrew's uh, Monastery for weekend retreats, uh, silent retreats and the like. So I, I think that the parallel to what you're talking about in terms of how you see the spiritual film has also been happening in the, certainly our evangelical community where there's much more of an emphasis, uh, at least in certain subgroups within the evangelical community of the contemplative uh, style. Well, you know, the, the Bible itself is, an oral history narrative. It was a story that was passed down from generation to generation. It didn't get written down until, you know, relatively late. So it had to have a kind of narrative. And so we are, that is also part of the Christian story is the story of the Old Testament, the new story. But inside that narrative is also contemplation. So Christ, you hear this story of Christ, and the crucial moment of his life, what does he do? He goes out in the desert and nothing happens. And basically he goes out to commune with himself and his God and, and decide. So even though the Bible is full of narrative arcs, you know, it has very critical contemplative moments in there. And I just find for myself that it's in those areas that you get closest to the mystery of the non-material world than you do by following a narrative of somebody you know who lived 900 years. Yeah. And another example might be Elijah. Um, we translate that in many of the translations, a, a, sound, a still small voice. He's there in Sinai. It's after the wind and the fire and the earthquake and so on. 
the, the Hebrew words actually is the sound of sheer silence. But you know, it's interesting that uh, when you think about the afterlife, uh, I, I've got to say as a getting older, uh, reading Tom Wright, N.T. Wright on the resurrection life really makes me tired. Uh, we're going to keep doing stuff. It's, it's very material. Uh, and, and yet the, the tradition was the visio dei or the visio Christi, the, the, the contemplative vision of Christ. And I think that's a big issue. I, th I think it's not unrelated to what you're talking about, Paul, is that uh, we, we have now taken that, that fast track, you know, image after image, action after action, and actually transpose that onto the afterlife, the resurrected state. And we may be missing something uh, about the visio dei, the, yeah. the contemplative uh, beholding the divine glory. Uh, I don't know, I, it seems to me there's an important issue there that we, uh, this kind of discussion raises for us. One of, one of the tricks you get into when you're talking about transcendental style is using the narrative predisposition of the viewer. The viewer, you know, wants to follow a story. So you're playing along, but all the while you're undercutting what you're doing and slowing it down till finally you get the viewer to the quiet place. Yeah. Uh, but you can't start out there. Yeah. If contemplative or spiritual films happen by slowing down towards stasis, might they not also happen with superabundance, in which you get the human out of the way by too much language, like glossolalia? Yeah. So you not only have the Christian Reformed minimalism, but you have the Pentecostal maximalism. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> um, <laughs> But again, it sort of strikes me like fast meditation or, you know, meditation for idiots. Um, uh, unless, of course, you're dealing with a spell, yeah. you know, in which case in some of the Pentecostals you are dealing with a spell. So just like a whirling dervish or an ayahuasca ceremony, you're seeking to uh, leave you know, immediate human experience and, and going to a, a delirium. Um, I don't know if that kind of spiritual delirium is the same as the contemplative one. But you could make that argument very, very well. And a lot of people who are into ayahuasca have made that argument. And it is a, a kind of seductive one. Paul, many of your films have uh, tough, situations, characters in extremity. Um, depravity is all too real. And that's, though it wasn't transcendental style, it nevertheless is the context of your trying to move beyond that or to suggest some faint hope. Certainly in First Reformed, that's the case. In, is it necessary that we start with sin and depravity? When we tell that story that leads to spiritual insight? Well, if you come from the background I came from, there is nothing but sin and depravity. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my, my best works are filthy rags in the sight of the Lord. I was taught this. Uh, well, that's, you know, that's a kind of downbeat message. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, Calvinism doesn't spring from transcendentalism, from the Emersonian belief in the good, goodness of man. It springs from belief of inherent evil of man. So uh, that's the, the tradition I'm from. And the tradition, of course, that I had to exercise um, and accommodate and expiate, you know, over the years. And now you go to a Presbyterian church. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I, when I was a kid, I went, went to the, the Christian Reformed. And then when I decided to go back to church, uh, I, uh, I thought I'd do the opposite. So Christian Reformed Church was all guilt and no ritual. <laughs> 
So I became Episcopalian, which I figured was all ritual and no guilt. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, and then I moved, and I, I switched again, and I ended up with with the Presby's, and uh, so that sort of seems right at the moment. I, I think that uh, for, for me, uh, I don't want to completely discount the total depravity <laughs> as a place to begin, uh, and I think in our, at least your past and my present tradition. That has uh, been due to a couple of things. One is that for us, it's just a fact of life. I mean, you said all too real. Well, it is real, you know. Neil Planninger wrote this really fine book called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, uh, getting the line out of uh, the film uh, Grand Canyon, uh, where this inner city guy says, it's just not the way it's supposed to be. And that's a deep, deep sense that we think sometimes gets not recognized in other traditions. So... And, and there's also just the fact that, see, you were you were raised a lot on the Psalms, you know. I am evil, born in sin, thou desirest truth within. I mean, the Psalms really do have that, you know, that things are pretty bad. And but but I think the positive side is that we have wanted to uh, highlight the fact of depravity, in order also to highlight the reality of grace, um, and that. Uh, the depravity without grace, and and I saw some grace in 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 first reformed as well. Tom Luddy, who runs the Telluride Festival, said to me that it had struck him when he watched it that he was watching the descendants of grace. That what happened is that grace had fallen on the, onto this man in the form of this vision, you know, and. Uh, so, um, and he, and the, the character, the reverend, talks about that earlier. You know, you can choose to live the good life. And grace covers us all, and I believe this. So, you know, it's, it's set up for that. There's a sense in which that style for many people leads to a content. It's a transcendental style, but that transcendental style produces an experience of transcendence. And, and that's a content. And, you know, when you, you get to the end point of uh, one of the great Ozu films, there's not that much difference from that end point as you do when you get to a, a spiritual film, you know, because you are, you are just left with the quiet. And, you know, that's what uh, hit me so powerfully after I had seen Bresson, I went to the Shojuku Theater in Los Angeles. There used to be one on La Brea. And, um, and I saw Autumn Afternoon, which was uh, Ozu's last film. And I was just stunned that a film could actually work this way and from a non-Western tradition and so forth. And that's when it started hitting me that, you know, if a guy in Japan is doing the same thing as a guy in France, it can't really be about content. It has to be about how, uh, how, not why, and not, not what. So I, I'm wondering if we maybe make too strong a, a, a division here in saying this, will, this has possibility of being a spiritual film. For the last 10 years, I've asked students in my theology and film class to write a paper on the film that was most spiritually significant in their life. I don't tell them what spiritual means. You would be shocked, but not really, at what films were most spiritually significant. Some of them are quite bad. Some of them are Toy Story 3. <laughs> Everybody says they cried when they saw it. Um, so I'm asking the question of how, how are we really, we could do movement and, and time. But I, you know, I take the position that you really have to be quite rigorous when using certain language. Otherwise, the language doesn't have any meaning. Right. When I first started, was I wrote the first big article on film noir. And, you know, I believe then, I believe now, that film noir is a historical period. It goes from 46 to, at the far extremity, it's 58. And if you understand it as a period of film history, of certain style, certain 
black and white films. You real the term has power and meaning. But now I've run into people who think film noir is not a historical period, but is in fact a whole type of film. And now they are calling films made in color. You know, they're calling Chinatown a film noir, and they're calling all kinds of things a film noir. And at that point, I don't know if the term film noir means much anymore. It's just become so malleable that you can sort of apply it to anything. And so I think the same is true about a spiritual film. If you can make a Toy Story a spiritual film, well, what isn't a spiritual film? <laughs> um, you know, so I would much prefer to have a definition that is really quite narrow and functional than a, a definition that's broad and, um, and uh, amorphous. Right. <laughs> One of my students early on, um, it was in a theology class, was asked to write, I asked to write on their understanding of Jesus as seen in The Last Temptation of Christ and then in Bart or whatever else they were reading. An Indian woman hadn't seen too many movies, and she said, so I was going to go to the movies, so I decided I would take my mother, and the two of us would go. And she, her mother, had seen even fewer and was quite conservative in her. She wrote that when she saw that movie, she had been struggling because even though she grew up here, she'd gone back to her roots in India as an 18-year-old, and she saw thousands and thousands upon 18, 20-year-old girls on the street. She felt called to do that, but didn't have the, no, I mean, yeah. she needed to get her education and so on. She said, when she saw that film in which Jesus was tempted in every way possible to be an ordinary person with a family and to grow up and to have kids, that's what she had wanted, and she knew if she went back to India, that could never happen. She saw the movie, and she said, I'm going to India. Wow. Wow. And she went to India. So, so there's that spiritual experience that comes from an, an action film. I won't call it a spiritual film. I hear you. Um, yeah. But that's neat, and that happens. Well, you know, the, what, what's interesting about that film is... I find, you know, so the original text is Greek Orthodox in nature, and it's rather mystical. Then I adapt it in a Protestant tradition, and Mari directs it in a Catholic tradition. And so it's sort of like a plexiglass layer cake where you see this stuff filtering through. And at the same time, the film is also about the temptations of Christ they vary, you know, and he keeps changing his mind. He said, you know, God is an ax. He wants me to cut the root. I mean, I am a sheep, God is a shepherd. You know, God is it. And you know, by the time he convinces his disciples of one path, he now moves on to another one. And, and then finally comes down to God is love. But, um, you know, that constant struggle of trying to figure out what does God want from me uh, is, of course, one that uh, is known to us all. Any of you have questions? Please. Uh, it's an honor to speak to you, sir. Uh, a couple of things real quick. Uh, I believe your film Affliction is a masterpiece, and more folks should see it, so thank you for making that. I wanted to ask about your writing process and if there's any um, contemplative component to that, especially regarding when you're writing more spiritually inclined films, and if you could share a bit about your process writing. I believe that writing is not part of the literary tradition, it's part of the <laughs> oral tradition. And that before you write, you tell. And you tell and you tell again. And if you can tell a story for 45 minutes, you have a movie. And, and, if, it does, and, uh, and if you just keep telling a story over and over again, one of two things will happen. One, you'll get sick of it and it will die. Uh, 
And that will be a great day for you because you have just been spared four, four to five months of writing something that nobody really wanted to see. <laughs> or the opposite thing will happen and the idea will start get tired of you and it will say, stop this right now. I want to exist. I want you to write me. I don't want to be told one more time. I now want to be written. I'm ready. And then off you go. So I, I, I still do work in this oral, traditional way. And if I'm not mistaken, you said at some point, because of that, you don't want more than five or ten lines that are literary masterpieces because that's not what people orally say. Is that something like what you've said? Well, I mean, if you become aware of, uh, you know, that's why you sort of, you have to mix the poetic with the, with the prosaic and hide the poetic inside the prosaic so it sort of sneaks up on people. But I've often, you know, I, I did a film that Harold Pinter wrote, and I love the approach Harold had which was that language is a tool we use not to communicate. This is how we don't understand each other. We use words. And I think there is some truth in that. Please. Um, I also want to thank you for the film last night. And on another personal level, I also am very grateful for your work in Last Temptation of Christ. It's easily one of the top five most influential films in my spiritual life. Um, as I was listening to you speak, I was considering the work of Steve McQueen, um, I feel like watching him, he uses a lot of these, what you call transcendental elements in terms of slowing things down and uh, delayed cuts, that that type of visu visual effect. And as an audience member, I feel I'm cognizantly aware of that, but at the same time, I feel I'm very deeply invested emotionally and in a narrative structure. And so I'm wondering how you would maybe categorize his work. Is he using this which, style? Which or McQueen else? films are you referring to? Well, I was thinking Hunger and Shame and then 12 Years a Slave to varying degrees. Yeah, I mean, uh, Hunger, uh, I, I, I can see that more. Um, you know, I've never actually gone to that place with McQueen. Uh, it never struck me as a place where I would make a connection. But the, the same thing happened with... Uh, you know, this article I wrote, I, I sent it around to a number of people, Jonathan Rosenbaum and other Richard Brodke, uh, and, you know, they all came back with people I had missed, you know, Kaiselovsky or someone else, uh, Oliveris. And I said, yes, there are people I miss because um, I'm not universal, you know, I lock into certain people and, and some people get lost. And, you know, maybe I miss McQueen or maybe uh, I should have missed him, I don't know. <laughs> Let me ask, please, but I'll ask a question. Given those personal additions to first reform, given that you discovered you said yesterday, sort of after you wrote it, what deep connections there were with Taxi Driver. Your own sense that that this rounds out or there's a coming back in the excellence of this new movie. In in what sense is this movie you? I, I, I decide after talking with Pavel Pavlovsky that I'm going to write the movie that I swore I would never write. So I'm going to write a film about the life of the spirit. So what films have meant something to me? Start watching films, you know, uh, all across the slow cinema perspective. And you come back to the films that have meant something to you. You have the main character from Country Priest. You have the setting from Winter Light. You have the levitation from The Mirror. You have... Uh, the ending from Mordet. Now, these are elements that uh, you are going to combine in your own way to make fresh again. What you don't quite realize is that the glue you are using or the cord you are using to bind these together is, in fact, the thing that you wrote very first of all that brought you into 
the process of storytelling, which was Taxi Driver. And I knew there was Taxi Driver in the movie, but I didn't know how much, that there was so much. But now I see that it's the glue that holds all these, these elements together. And, uh, and I wasn't quite that aware of it when, when it was happening. Thank you. Please. I want to thank you particularly for, for your book, for your master's thesis, which has uh, just given birth to such a rich conversation. I have a question about Correda, actually, because I saw that he, he's in your, your chart, yeah. um, and specifically about Japanese film. And if you feel like, obviously, I read what you wrote about Ozu and Zen, but do you think there's something about Japanese culture in particular that lends itself to the transcendental style that you're talking about? And when you put Correra on the chart, would you classify him as someone who makes slow movies or is maybe perhaps something slightly different? Well, I'm a little bit of both. Uh, the, the one that stands out is with the still walking, or what's it called? Still walking. Yeah. That, that's, that's the one that I remember most vividly. Um, at the same time that Antonioni was using these long, slow takes, uh, Mizuguchi was doing the same thing. Um, but Mizuguchi was much more interested in the life of sin and the life of the, of, of the fallen person, whereas Ozu was really interested in the interaction of a physical space. You know, so much of Ozu is just about, you know, how objects are arranged and how he can get you to a place that you didn't think you were going to go. And it's really deft that way. When I was writing First Reformed and preparing to make it, I envisioned it as a very slow film that would really be right on the edge of boredom. Then I saw the film after I'd finished and was showing it, and I realized that people were never bored. And I thought, well, maybe I should re-edit it and make it more boring, um, you know, because I had a lot of boring stuff I was shot, you know, just endless walking. You know, he goes to the hospital, he walks down three different corridors. Um, and, uh, and I think that part of me that, um, you know, that didn't want to bore people too much you know, ended up there. Uh, and so I'm smart enough to know you got to slow people down. But I'm also invested enough in storytelling to know that you can't, they can't leave the theater. You know, if they leave the theater, you have lost them. And uh, I'm reminded of, of Bellatar. He was at a screening and uh, one of his longer films. And he came in front of the audience and looked at them and said, why are you all still here? <laughs> you know, I did everything I could to make you leave. <laughs> Rich, any final comments? No, just that, uh, you know, as, as pe people in theological scholarship who study spiritualities, and there really are multiple ones. And, you know, you can just take a look at the Catholic orders, for example. You have Benedictine, and, and even Thomas Merton thought Benedictine was too tame, so Trappist. And then within Trappist, the Hermitage. Then you get Franciscan, you get Jesuit, you get Dominican. Uh, multiple spiritualities. But can't there be multiple spiritualities in spiritual film uh, that are, are somewhat different than the your notion of the of the ideal or the yeah, you know I mean I think Rosalini is you know when when Rosalini does uh, Boys to Italy he's right there you know there's no uh, you know overt religious consciousness in that film but it is a transcendental style he turns around and then he does the film about the saint the the birds Francis. Uh, what was that called? Rosalini's film about St. Francis. It was called St. Francis. Um, and it's not a spiritual film. He makes a film about the material world of St. Francis, but he makes a film about the spiritual world of Ingrid Bergman and George Sanders. So, it, yes, <laughs> you know, it, uh, it, it is 
you know, like so many of these things, you know, uh, it's, you know it when you when you know it, but it gets awfully hard to say exactly. Mm -hmm. I want to, please, were you going to say? No, no, no. I just think that there is a value in defining things yeah. very strictly, even if people don't agree with you, because you have given them a framework not Correct. to agree with. Yeah, I understand. That's great. Elijah, please. Well, you said a while ago in your lecture that the filmmakers that you identified with the style, Ozu and Brisson and uh, Bergman originally, that um, it was important that they were making films for a popular audience um, as opposed to the art film directors that came later, the Tarkovsky split. Um, why is that important, that they were making films for a popular audience, and then how? Because they, they really cared about conveying that message to people who would come out to a theater and invest some money in it. They weren't after this audience in the film festivals and the, and the museums, you know, who are seeing an installation. Um, that's a different kind of phenomenon. And when the slowness of the film starts to get exaggerated into its conceptual extremity, then it has lost a contact with how it actually works. Because, you know, you know, there's a, you know, Wayne Bain makes a nine hour film. Um, he's doing something else. He's not trying to operate in a, in the context of theater going, he's really essentially making an inst installation piece. Uh, or the, the wonderful film, The Clock, which runs 24 hours, and uh, is just really wonderful, but it, you know, it can only be shown in museums. And, and then, then, of course, there's, there's something called uh, the walking film, which uh, one writer has called a vestibular cinema because of the inner ear. And these are just films of people walking. And Gus Van Sant, may, he, uh, one of the few times in American cinema where you have uh, someone working in the slow cinema side, and that's Gus Van Sant doing his death trilogy of Elephant and uh, what the other two were. And, and then there is... Uh, uh, an Israeli one I saw recently it was just a kid wandering around Jerusalem, and then there's a Buddhist one made in Taiwan of a monk, and all you see is an hour and a half of a man walking, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know. So, but at that point, in my mind, you're just making a point. Um, you're not really trying to communicate, and I guess. I've been on these juries uh, where these films kind of win. And, and in fact, everyone is so proud that they actually sat through a film that they wouldn't have sat through because they didn't have any choice. That they sort of say, you know, I'm better than you. I'm going to give this an award because you're not going to sit through it. <laughs> Perhaps on that high note. <laughs> um, if you haven't seen... Paul's interview with Terry Gross, or heard the podcast that was 30 years ago and was just recently um, rebroadcast by Terry. Go online. It's a wonderful interview. Um, among other things that Paul says, I've always had this sort of proselytizing urge to go out and communicate and convert. <laughs> Well, my, you know, my father was a frustrated minister, and um, he had to drop out uh, during the Depression to feed his family. So I was raised, we were raised to fulfill that, uh, that task. And, um, and then I realized as a young man, I really couldn't be a minister because I didn't really like people. <laughs> and <laughs> so then I thought I would be a lawyer. And then I realized I couldn't be a lawyer because I couldn't, you know, sympathize with their problems. So I thought, well, what am I going to, and then I thought, oh, I can be an artist because then, you know, uh, I can just do whatever I want. But I, 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 and I, I 
I can take that soapbox, you know, out of uh, out of the pulpit and yeah. walk it into the middle of the street. But I was one of those kids that went door to door. You know, have you met Jesus Christ, your personal savior? Blah, 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 blah. And uh, so that was part of that proselytizing urge. I, I'll finish with a funny story that has nothing to do with any of this. But my mother had in the front hallway, she had these cards that she had made up and written out, which were refutation texts for the various religions. Uh, one for uh, Seventh-day Adventists, one for Christian scientists, and she had them all set up. And then she would spot them coming down the street and would get some coffee and, and cookies and get the refutations out and invite them in to the kitchen and start refuting all their doctrines until finally you would see them trying to back out and try to get away. <laughs> and that's one of the pleasures of her life, just sort of <laughs> bushwhacking these poor missionaries. <laughs> With that, we'll, we'll, let's thank Paul Schrader for a wonderful evening.